Only 4% of universities in the U.S. are R1 research institutions, and Temple University is one of them. This means 100% of students have the opportunity to participate in hands-on learning and research with world-class faculty. With over 600 academic programs across 17 schools and colleges, Philadelphia's largest public university provides students with a rich variety of opportunities and propels graduates to succeed in their careers. Temple University. Schedule a campus tour today at admissions.temple.edu. visit Hey guys, it's Mishi. Last month we aired an episode called Horsing Around, about a Palestinian horse breeder from Kafar Aqab in the West Bank. And on that very same day, November 17th, just as the episode made its way to your feeds, my wife Federica and I rushed to a hospital in Jerusalem. A few hours later, this happened. Push, push, push. Bravo. Amazing, Fede. Congratulations. Mazal Tov. What is it? I told you. I know. We don't know what it is. It's a girl. I knew it. Our now three-week-old adorable little daughter is called Halel Miriam, and here is the main audio she's been producing ever since she was born. (coughs) Our new episode will therefore be out soon, but we definitely don't want to leave you without your dose of Israel story. So today, at the very start of Hanukkah, we're revisiting and updating one of our fan favorites. Now, at the center of the Hanukkah tale is the story of the Maccabees entering the desecrated temple and finding a single sealed jug with just enough oil to light the menorah for one night. But miraculously, of course, that oil somehow lasted for eight nights. A few years ago, we aired a story about a different kind of jug of liquid that, at least for one person, held a similarly significant and miraculous meaning. So, from the vaults of our archive, we bring you The Pitcher. If you've never heard this story or haven't heard it in years, we hope you listen and enjoy. And if you want to skip straight to the update, just go ahead to the last few minutes of this episode. Okay, without further ado, here's our 2017 story, The Pitcher. For lack of a better way to describe it, I'd say that my high school English class was more of an exercise in shelling, blasting, and precision artillery Repeat. than in grammar, vocab, and reading comprehension. Chizrut. Map. Map. Picture. Picture. Umbrella. Umbrella. Okay, let me back up. Good. On September 1st, 1998, I found myself walking into a new school on the first day of 10th grade, not knowing a soul. One of my first friends was another new kid, Ariel, Ariel Arpaz. Ariel and I met in English class. We were both in Dovran Glit, the English speaker's section, and I knew we'd be friends from day one. He was, and still is, the craziest kid I've met. Our English class met on Mondays for a double period separated by a 20-minute long recess. Ariel and I sat next to each other, at the back of the classroom, and almost immediately we took heavy fire from Aviv Pongil, a mischievous Australian kid, who had made us practice targets for his mechanical pencil turned spitball gun. Ariel and I tried to retaliate, but it was clear that we were no match for Aviv's mini-bombs. And then, towards the middle of the year, Everything changed when Ariel got his license and bought a red Kimco motorcycle. Now, this was big news. Ariel was one of the only kids in our grade who had a bike, and it made him instantly popular. But as far as English class was concerned, the implications were even more dramatic. We could now leave school during the break, hop on his motorcycle, drive to the nearby central bus station, buy 150 grams of chocolate-covered raisins, otherwise known as ammunition, drive back to school and spend the entire second period pelting the back of Aviv's head with the candy. Now, other than the fact that Ariel drove so fast that I would literally kiss the ground when we got back to school, this was pure joy. 
For the rest of the year, we turned our English classes into a never-ending food fight. We perfected our aim, Aviv perfected his aim, and the ensuing mayhem would test the limits of our teacher, who, ironically, was called Ivria, which means the Hebrew one. Till one day, it all came to an abrupt end. An errant chocolate-covered almond, that wasn't even supposed to be in the bag with the raisins, hit the girl sitting next to Aviv. I nearly got expelled. Game over. Ariel and I left the world of food fights for good. Or at least, so I thought. Less than a month after we graduated high school, we all went into the army. Just by chance, Ariel, my English class partner in crime, was drafted into the same unit as two of my closest childhood friends, Shai Satran and Yochai Meital, who years later would create Israel Story with me. They all became good friends, so Ariel's always been part of the show's orbit. He even made a cameo appearance in one of our earliest stories, about self-inflicting bee stings as a way of getting sick days from the army. But as we all learned over the years, the epic bombardments with Aviv Pongir were nothing more than child's play for Ariel. This whole time he was actually engaged in a much more important food fight. A high-stakes food fight. A crusade for recognition. A few weeks ago, on a hot Friday morning of midsummer, Shai and I met up with our friend Ariel. He wanted to fill us in on a story. And then we were going to go to his favorite hummus joint. Pinati. Pinati is an iconic workers' restaurant on the corner of King George and Aistadrut streets, in the center of Jerusalem. Here's Ariel. It's important to say that Pinati is known for its hummus, and it's probably the best hummus in Jerusalem. And it's definitely the best Jewish hummus that I've come across. And we should just say that Pinati, it's just like one small room. Yeah, Pinati is a place that has four tables inside, and each table has five seats. Uh, it's actually four seats, and they can squeeze in five. And you sit with people you don't know as you eat. But Pinati is much more than just a dive. It's a Jerusalem institution. Local politicians go there to appear connected to the people. Famous athletes pop by for hummus after practice. And for the past two decades, it is also regularly fed one extremely loyal client, Mr. Ariel Harpaz. Uh, we used to cut school and go to Pinati every day. And it was then, over countless plates of hummus in the late 90s, that Ariel noticed a problem. He was constantly thirsty. I used to drink a lot of cups of juice while we were eating. Calling the phosphorescent petal liquid served at Pinati juice might be a bit misleading. As Ariel pointed out, petal is more like the Israeli version of Kool-Aid. It's a, a very cheap syrup that uh, you add water to. And in Pinati you have two flavors. You've got one a grape flavor and you've got a lemon flavor. And it's uh, usually you, each cup is two shekels. But although two shekels wasn't that much, even for a high school kid, it started adding up. Always the businessman, Ariel, went up to the owner, Meir, who sits at the cash register, and asked how much it would cost to get unlimited petal refills. Now, Meir's not one for change. In fact, Pinati's menu basically hasn't changed at all since Meir's father opened the place in 1974. But Ariel was a good kid, and clearly a thirsty kid. So uh, he thought about it for a few seconds, and then he said it'll cost you eight shakos, and you have a limited amount of uh, petel. Needless to say, Ariel was thrilled. But it didn't take long before he noticed that the new unlimited refills policy solved the monetary problem, but introduced an interpersonal one instead. He kept on handing the waiters his empty cup, till more or less all they did was bounce like yo-yos between the juice dispenser and Ariel's table. I felt bad that I kept on harassing them for more and more and more uh, juice. So I came to the owner and I asked him, can, can we change this deal from unlimited juice to a, a pitcher of juice? At first, Mayer claimed he didn't have a pitcher. But Ariel asked him to check again. So he goes behind to the storage room and he, I see like things are flying, you know, he's moving tables and uh, boxes and stuff and he finds a pitcher. So he brings back the pitcher and now I have a pitcher. We're talking about a very cheap plastic pitcher. 
It's like half a gallon uh, of, of juice. And so, thanks to Ariel's sheer doggedness, a new item at Pinati was born. Or, sort of. See, every time Ariel would come in for some hummus, which was very often, he'd ask the waiters for a pitcher. And the waiters always said, we don't have a pitcher. We don't know what we're talking about. And every time it was the same story. So I had to look at the owner, and the owner would catch me in my eye and said, ah, him, give him everything he wants. Give him anything he wants. And then I, they would go back and get me my pitcher, and, you know, and this went on for like a year, a year and a half, every time I had to prove to them that they have a pitcher and I deserve it. Because it wasn't on the menu. It wasn't on the menu. So it was like one of these items that like only real regulars, people in the know, would know to ask. No, it was only me for a long time. <laughs> in an unprecedented move, Meir officially modified Pinati's offerings. And Ariel was, for all intents and purposes, the father of the pitcher. That was his claim to fame. Many people who know me, I mean, at some point will hear this story. This is a part of who I am. And he's very proud of it. I mean, I invented a concept. You realize that, like, a pitcher is something that exists in many, many places around the world. What I invented was not a pitcher. I invented the option to change something in Pinati, the open-mindedness to change. I brought change to Pinati. For years, he's been telling us that he regards this as the pinnacle of his creative life. This is definitely one of the most important and greatest achievements of my life. I don't know if that means I haven't achieved much or this is just really important. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> now, the walls of Pinati, like many family-run restaurants or dry cleaners in the States, are full of pictures of all kinds of celebrities who walk through the door, posing with the owner. But here, it's not about bragging rights for the establishment. In Pinati's case, it's the folks in the photographs who are dying to be seen on the wall. Prime ministers, actors, any person who is who and who in Jerusalem, or if he came from the big city, Tel Aviv, he usually gets uh, awarded as well. It's sort of like a sign that you've made it if you get on the wall in Pinati, right? Yeah, there's no bigger respect in Jerusalem than having a picture in Pinati, on the wall. Pinati, as you'll recall, is a really small place, and there isn't that much wall real estate. That means that competition to make it onto the wall is fierce. Even Teddy Kalik and Bibi have been bumped. Only Herzl and Begin, Meir recently told me, have everlasting wall immunity. But Ariel was convinced that as the inventor of the picture, he should be up there, immortalized. For him, more than anything, it was a matter of recording his accomplishment for posterity. I need to have a picture on the wall with my picture to prove for the rest of history that I invented the picture. And this is why this story is so important, because I don't have children. This is the closest I have to children, is to have a picture in Pinati. Ariel made his case to Meir, the owner, who mulled it over. I just want to point out one thing about Meir. Meir is like this very old-fashioned Kurdish Jew, very typical Jerusalemite. He knows everyone, and he's basically a celebrity in, in Jerusalem. And he's really amazing with people, and he's really, really street smart. By the time Meir decided, after much deliberation, to grant him this tremendous honor, Ariel was already in the army, and the matter got postponed a bit. But ultimately, he came in and posed for the camera. Can you describe the picture? The picture is a picture of one of my friends, the owner, Meir, and me with a picture. That proves beyond doubt that I'm the inventor of the picture. Yet life, and an uncomfortable dispute among Ariel's friends as to who should be included next to him in the picture, got in the way. As a result, the photo never went up on the wall. Meanwhile, Ariel moved away. First to Tel Aviv, then abroad. He studied law, started businesses. And many years later, he returned to his old stomping ground. At this point, I haven't been to Pinati like five, six, seven years. And I was going out with this chick, and we go to Pinati, and we come especially from Tel Aviv. It was a Friday afternoon, which is the busiest time of the week at Pinati, when all the soldiers coming home for the weekend pop in for a quick hummus. 
So anyway, we get to Pinati and I'm standing outside and like suddenly one of the waiters sees me and he comes and he hugs me and then a different waiter looks at me and he sees me and he comes and hugs me and then the owner sees me and he comes and kisses me and I'm feeling like, you know, a lot of respect and love in my way and I'm really excited. You know, this is Pinati and I mean, this was an important place for me, you know, growing up. The real reason Pinati is so successful is because Meir makes you feel so important when you come there. It's like where everybody knows your name and they're, all, they're always glad you came. So with that royal homecoming reception, Ariel and his date sat down to eat. And we order. And then Meir, the owner, comes by me and asks him, do people still order uh, pictures here? And then he looks at me and he says, what? He's disgusted with what I'm saying. Everybody orders pictures. It's the biggest thing here. And then he walks away. And as he walks away, I realize that this guy, it seems like he's not crediting me for inventing the picture. Ariel was stunned. His fear had come true. His invention had been forgotten. Not only did he embarrass me in front of my girlfriend, I'm like sitting there just like shocked. I mean, I feel like he spat in my face. Ariel, you might have already ascertained, is not one to take a perceived slight lightly. Especially not when it comes to something as weighty as his liquid legacy. I look at him and I tell him, Mayor, 10 years ago, I came here. You only had cups of juice at the time, and I told you, I want to have... A- Ariel went on to recount how that had led to him harassing the waiters for constant refills, and how he came up with the idea of the pitcher. He reminded Meir that even after the invention, it was always a struggle. And Meir would have to instruct his waiters to give Ariel whatever he wanted, till they decided to make it official with the picture on the wall, which never went up. And the reason we did all of this was so I don't come here 10 years later and hear this bullshit that you tell me that I didn't invent the picture. He looks at me and then he says, Mechila, mechila, mechila. Kol mila shelcha emet. Ata avia kankan. Ata avia kankan. I ask for your forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. Every word that you spoke is true. You are the father of the, of the pitcher. You are the father of the pitcher. Redeemed, Ariel took his date and went back home. And I realized that I have about four weeks before his memory blacks out again. And uh, this is like my golden time to get the picture back on the wall. He found the image in an old email account and printed out several different options. I don't know if I should do an A4, A5, A6. I just don't know how to deal with this. And I have no one to consult with. Because everybody, first of all, thinks that this is the dumbest story they've ever heard. They can't believe I'm wasting my time on this. Usually I'll talk to like, my business partner and you know, I'll have like, a creative team help me out, work out my problems. But this is just wasting their time on something that only I think is important. Because they're not from Jerusalem. They don't understand the importance of this. He also went back and forth on whether to include a caption. He decided to go for it. To our second home, with love, the father of the picture. Ariel framed the picture, and with a mixture of excitement and trepidation, made another Friday afternoon pilgrimage to Jerusalem. When Ariel walked in, Meir said hi, as usual. But Ariel couldn't tell whether it was because he remembered him as the father of the picture, or else was just being friendly. He always remembers me as a person. Like, he says hello and he knows me, but he doesn't remember my name or why he knows me. We need to tattoo on him that I invented the pitcher. Ariel sat down, ordered a hummus, and of course a pitcher of petel, and took his time. And then uh, I wait until the place is almost empty, and I come to him and I say, remember what we said? And I pull out the picture, and he says, sure, no problem, like fully nonchalant, as if it's like most normal thing and no problem at all. And then he said, leave it here, I'll put it up tomorrow night. And I look at him, I said, tomorrow night? It's like Saturday night, the pinati isn't even open on Saturday night. Feeling that something was a bit fishy, Ariel became adamant. What? He said impatiently. I came especially. I'm not waiting, we have to do this now. So he said, but I can't, people are eating next to the spot. Ariel asked Meir where he intended to hang his picture. Meir pointed to the corner, where an Orthodox couple were finishing up their meal. Maybe the worst real estate on the wall. What made it bad real estate? This spot is, as you walk in, it's on the far left, and it's on the, on the far low corner. Far left, low corner. So no one, it's not visible to everyone eating, because if somebody's sitting next to it, you can't see it. But on the other hand, it's not that far from the juice dispensers. Yes, it, it actually is the closest uh, picture to the juice dispenser. Which is itself kind of an honor. It, um, I... Uh, the fact that it's next to the juice dispenser, I mean, it's maybe, I mean, it, it 
from the poetic point of view, is beautiful, but it means nothing because you want a good real estate inside the place. Ariel was disappointed, no doubt. But he tried to console himself. After all, he was so close now. Inside, I'm trying to convince myself that it's okay, that we know, I mean, every real estate is good on the wall in Pinati, and I can't be a pig. <sighs> After so many years, Ariel's dream was coming true. His picture went up on the wall of Pinati. And then we had like a whole five, ten minutes of me and my friends and different people around taking pictures of my picture on the wall, with Meir, without Meir, posing. And you can see in the pictures that I'm very proud. I send this on WhatsApp to all my family and friends, and like this is like a glorious day for me. In fact, I remember receiving those pictures from Ariel at the time, and imagining just how happy he must be. You can see them too, by the way, on our website. Anyway, just before leaving Pinati, a jubilant, if always practical Ariel, did one last thing. I looked at Meir in the eye, and I pointed at him, and I told him, Meir, I don't want to come here in 20 years and find out that uh, your son is running the place and is telling me that I didn't invent the picture. Therefore, the picture needs to stay on the wall. And he said, don't worry, don't worry, no problem, no problem. Famous last words. I promised myself that I'm going to continue on going to Pinati every once in a while to supervise that my picture is still on the wall. You had doubts? Um, Yeah, I had doubts. Because, I mean, if somebody different comes in now, more important, I mean, they might switch your picture. I mean, who knows? But the next few times Ariel came to check, he was pleased to see his smiling self in the far left corner holding up his brainchild, the picture. It seemed as if Ariel could relax. His legacy was safe. A few months ago, I got a flurry of frantic text messages from Ariel. He had just learned, to his utter astonishment, that his picture was no longer on the wall, and he wanted our help. We'll be right back. And now, back to our episode. Ariel thought that showing up at Pinati with the radio crew might not only increase his chances of getting back on the wall, but could potentially even land him a better spot, right behind May, at the cash register. And that's how Shai and I found ourselves on that sweltering Friday morning, helping Ariel reclaim his rightful place in history. So we're, we're now in a strategy, a planning strategy conversation about what's going to happen. And Shai, uh, myself and Ariel are in the studio. We're about to go to Pinati. It's Friday afternoon. So the first thing once we're there is to check on your real estate and see what's there? That's shy. No, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to sit down and order a hummus and relax. Are we going to order a pitcher? We will. Oh, by the way, important thing, the pitcher these days has changed. It's like a high-tech pitcher and has maybe a sixth, like 15% juice of the original one. How does that make you feel as the father of the pitcher? I have no problem with male's economics. It's fine with me. As long as there's a picture and I'm acknowledged as the inventor. Because you know, a lot of people, they're like, if they invent something, they're really particular about it staying exactly the way they invented it. No, no, I'm, uh, I don't, I'm not, I mean, I invented a concept. Shai, who was an officer in the army, was eager to get back to the nitty-gritty planning. Do we need to, like, plot this out, like, military style? Do we need, like, uh, matarot, mesimot? Like, what's, what's the overarching goal? Okay, the number one objective is to get this back on the wall. We're going to see if we manage to get it behind Meir, better positioned. And if not, we're going to accept it, and we're going to take any space we're th- that we're offered. If my picture stays on the wall in general in Pinati, and specifically behind Meir, for the rest of my life, I will be credited as the father of the picture, and I can die quietly. What we're doing today is setting the record straight. Do you think we're going to succeed? I have no doubt in my heart. The picture is going up on the wall. With that, three childhood friends in their mid-thirties set out on a mission. Like any good commander, Ariel gave us a final briefing. We're going to arrive to Pinati. Uh, We're going to be sitting at the table. I want all the equipment to be out, the radio equipment, the recording equipment. I want Mail to be aware that there's uh, something happening, that there are journalists sitting and eating lunch. And we, like good soldiers, ask some clarifying questions. 
So if he comes to the table and says, hey, Ariel, want a pitcher? We can start talking about the pitcher. I mean, if it's up to us, we wait to the end. Uh, we finish eating, we understand who's against who, and then we, we attack the problem. Yep, that's us, about to attack the problem. Okay, so we're entering, we're entering Pinati. Everyone seemed genuinely glad to see Ariel. We sat down and casually ordered some hummus. Should we get a pitcher? Betach. Betach. Sure, Ariel said. Meir. When we were done eating, Ariel approached Meir. Once again, he relayed the entire saga. Everything he says is true, Meir acknowledged. But I have a problem. There's a waiting list for getting on the wall. It was clear that Ariel wasn't going to take no for an answer. And Chai and I exchanged a worried glance, hoping this wasn't about to get out of hand. It can't be that I don't get credit for my invention, Ariel complained. It got a bit testy, and Meir even called Ariel a nudnik, basically a pain in the ass. Ariel in turn said that Meir should be ashamed of himself. But then, realizing that his best way out of this situation was probably just to give in, Meir got up on a chair, found a tiny square of bare wall underneath the fluorescent light, and started banging in a nail. Seeing his picture back up there, a huge smile appeared on Ariel's face. Are you happy? Meir asked as they hugged it out. We're like family, he said. And just before we left, unsolicited, he promised Ariel that the picture would stay up. This time, for good. Okay, we made it. Arpaz, any last words? I want to thank everyone who helped me get this, uh, just helped me get here. Thank you guys. It was dirty and ugly, but it worked. Okay, so that was the story we ran back in 2017. And this week, three years later, I returned to the scene of action. Okay, it is December 9th. I am going into Pinati to speak to Meir and see what has happened since we aired the story about Harpaz's picture. And also mainly to see if Harpaz's picture is still on the wall. Like everywhere else these days, Pinati is takeout only. It's a bit depressing, to be honest. But Meir is his good old self. Earlier this year, during the first lockdown, Pinati was forced to shut down for an entire month. And amazingly, that was just the second time ever, since its opening in the 1970s, that Pinati didn't serve hummus on a weekday. The other time? Three days in the 1982. Lebanon war, that's it. So what's it like for you now to be takeaway only? I miss the, the customer. Look, it's very sad now. See, empty place. People eating outside in uh, paper, paper plates. We used to listen for the noise of the chairs and the cups and the spoons and the water. Now it's very, very sad. Still, I was hoping that there would be one thing at Pinati that hadn't changed. So Meir, is the picture still up on the wall? Meir looked at me, gestured to the wall, and cracked a wide smile. I will never, never, ever take this picture from the wall. Just like that, Ariel Arpaz, the inventor of the picture, joined the ranks of Theodore Herzl and Menachem Begin as the only people who will never be taken off the wall. In fact, Meir told me that ever since our episode aired, Ariel's picture has become quite the attraction. People start to come and say, excuse me, could you tell me about the picture of the juice? 
and it's continued. People call me all over the world. Say, ah, we heard the Israeli story. It's so nice, so fun. So it's been good for business. Fantastic for business, <laughs> <laughs> and ve- I'm very happy. So, Mayor, last question. Uh, we're going to be rerunning the story now for Hanukkah. Do you have anything to say to Israel story listeners around the world? Happy Hanukkah. Thank you very much. Ala kefak, Meir. Toda, toda. Mishi, thank you very much. Come to visit. You want some hummus now? I just uh, have to run back. I have a two-week-old baby. I just ah, had a baby. Ah, so I stuck home. Just ah. a minute. איזה חמוד אתה, תודה מאיר. ארי ג'ייקוב סקורד דיס אפיסוד, אינסלה וייס בלום, מיקס אד אל אפ. פאלו אס אין סושיאל מדיה, אינסטגרם, טוויטר, פייסבוק, אל אונדר איזרעל סטורי. אין, ווייל יור אדד, דונט פרגט טו סיין אפ פור אר ניוז לטר. אל יו אף טו איז גו טו איזרעל סטורי דאט אורג סלאש ניוז לטר. איזרעל סטורי איז פרודוסט אין פרטנרשיפ וויט טאבלט מגזין. Our staff is Yochai Meital, Zev Levi, Yoshi Field, Skyler Inman, Joel Shupak, Sharon Rappaport, and Rotem Tzin. Jeff Umbro from The Podglomerate is our marketing director. Marie Ruder, Clara Fug, Michael Vivier, and Alicia Vergara are our wonderful production interns. I'm Ishi Harman, wishing you a happy Hanukkah full of yummy latkes, delicious sufganiyot, light and joy. Okay, as always, stay safe, shalom shalom, and yalla bye! <laughs> חולפים חיי אל מול עיניי קולות מזמן אחר הלב אומר להתעורר מהר כל הדרכים נפתחות לפניך מתגלות מול עיניך בחייך כל התהיות נעלמות ברגע ועכשיו ברור מה חשוב ומה פחות אורות מהבבים בשתי שניות חולפים חיי אל מול עיניי קולות מזמן אחר הלב אומר להתעורר מהר Thank you.